The A-20, highly successful veteran attack bomber, is being replaced by the A-26, a bigger and more versatile fighting plane. Here in England, a bomber group makes the changeover and prepares to return to home base in France with their new aircraft. Designed with an all-purpose nose for the rapid change of armament to meet any fighting requirement, the new Douglas A-26 is potentially the world's most versatile attack bomber. Depending on its firepower and mission, the plane carries a crew of two or three. Its great adaptability, plus other features, enables the plane to exceed the high performance of the A-20. Although the Havoc was a fine horizontal glide and torpedo bomber, as well as a ground stroffer and night fighter, it could not be quickly adapted to the job at hand. Each change was a special modification. All such deficiency has been overcome in the A-26. With instruments checked and set, the planes line up for takeoff. Bearing only a family resemblance to the A-20, recognition keynote of the A-26 is its squareness. Cabin roof and forward belly are flat, giving the plane a boxy look. Wings set almost at right angles to the fuselage. Tail plane and huge fin are all square tipped. Large nacelles extend well forward and aft of the wing. Wingspan is 70 feet, length 49 feet 11 inches, height 18 feet 6 inches. Two 2,000 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines drive the Invader to well over 300 miles an hour at 20,000 feet. Cruising speeds depend on the mission and the range varies greatly with the load and equipment. At their base in France, the Invaders come in hot land at 120 miles an hour. On the hard stand, the planes are given a thorough servicing. The Invaders' top and bottom turrets give ample side and rear fields of 50 caliber fire, assure as much strength defensively as offensively. Eight removable 50 caliber package guns, which may be mounted on wing racks in place of bombs, and various armament, including a 75 millimeter cannon that can be mounted in the nose, make this plane one of the most heavily armed in the world. Types of the interchangeable nose vary from a lightly armed plexiglass model for bombing missions to the attack nose, which has one 75 millimeter and one 37 millimeter cannon, or a stroffing nose with six 50 caliber machine guns. As a bomber, the invader carries a load as great as that of a medium. Maximum, 6,000 pounds. Four 1,000 pounders or two 2,000 pound torpedoes may be carried internally and four 500 pounders externally. Other loadings include 125 gallon self-sealing bomb bay tank and bombs for long range missions. A few weeks before these takeoffs, the invaders made their first missions. Battle tested only a dozen times, seldom as a full group, the planes had already shown great effect in attacking the Germans along the Metz-Nancy salient. Now, at December's end, their ability proved they were taking off to carry on the fine work of the A-20s and raise more havoc over Germany, where it was needed most to flatten the Belgian bow. On December 24, 1944, the invaders struck at Zulpik, German headquarters communications center near Saarburg, Germany. Moderate but very accurate flak downed one plane in this operation, but the bombing, which included an important bridge, was successful. 250 and 1,000 pounders were dropped. The bridge, a congested highway link across the Saar River, vital in the supply system of the German First Army, was completely destroyed. Here, air participation directly affected the action of Patton's Third Army. This was the first good weather since the German offensive began 10 days before, and air power worked to tremendous advantage. This was due in part to the great prowess of the new invaders. Another A-26 target the same day was Arlon, Belgium, near the south side of the Bow. Arlon is on the main road from Luxembourg to Bastogne, and bombings like this helped ground forces clear that road by the following week when counterattacks drove the Nazis back along the whole Bastogne corridor. From this point on, air ground efforts steadily reduced the bulge, and the A-26 proved to be a fast, hard-hitting, highly competent bomber. 
when Germany is defeated, the invaders will help speed victory in the Pacific. As the bitter Italian winter swept through the Apennine Mountains, heavy snows isolated the little town of Castel di Sangro. Hunger threatened the snowbound communities as Italian flyers prepared to execute a plan to provision the inhabitants by air. Four Italian bombers were to airdrop 10 tons of flour provided by the Allies. At the briefing, the pilots listened intently beside their planes, obsolete Savoia Machetti 82s. This was more than an airdrop mission. This was an act performed in cooperation with the Allies. And cooperation with the Allies was the road back to democracy for conquered Italy. It was not always easy. To some Allied soldiers, the Italians seemed a miserable people. Sometimes they forgot how thoroughly the Nazis had ravaged Italy, smashing its factories, laying waste its fields. And they forgot that hunger will sometimes drive men to steal, children to beg. This is the target, snowbound Castel di Sangro, overlooking the bloody Sangro River Valley. This was a key town in the Rome Arno campaign. Bloody battles had been fought over this cold, almost impassable terrain as the Allies advanced against 28 enemy divisions, badly needed by the Nazis for use on other fronts. As the planes make their run over the dropping area, the falling flower becomes a symbol of Allied willingness to help Italy help itself. The Italian people are paying now for the years when Mussolini stamped and shouted about the glories of war. But Italians serving with the Allied armies, partisans behind Nazi lines, the Italian people, all point to the time when Italy may take its place in a peaceful and democratic world, a world in which fascism cannot exist. India-based B-29s pounded enemy repair facilities at Singapore Naval Base on the Malay Peninsula to keep battle-smashed Jap ships permanently out of action. Primary target for the 20th Bomber Command superforts was the Admiralty Dock in the North Wharf district of the former British stronghold. This great floating dry dock, Singapore's most important single installation, was 855 feet long and 172 feet wide the largest unit of its kind in operation throughout the entire South Seas area, could accommodate the biggest battleship afloat. Its loss, coming at a time when the enemy desperately needed repair facilities of every kind, would strike the Jap a vital blow. To knock it out of commission, 67 B-29s dropped 234 tons of 1,000-pound bombs from an altitude of 18,500 feet. The results testified to American materiel, American workmanship, and American flyers in action. Recon photos showed more than two-thirds of the floating dry dock submerged. A 460-foot vessel in the dry dock was hit and left burning furiously. Construction blocks, powerhouses, workshops, and boathouses were damaged and destroyed. Fighter opposition was weak, and flak ranged from weak to moderate. None of our planes was lost to enemy action. On November 24th, two liberators on a routine shipping search over Borneo's coastal waters attacked a Jap lugger at masthead level. For months, 13th Air Force heavies operating singly or in small numbers ranged wide over all possible routes to seek out and destroy enemy shipping. These attacks have forced Jap ships to follow roundabout, costly water routes. This great pressure on the enemy's already strained seaborne communications has virtually cut off the flow of raw materials to the Jap homeland and has kept supplies from reaching the enemy in the field. On December 16th, another Moratai-based 13th Air Force search plane approached Labuan Island in Brunei Bay while probing through Borneo's north coastal areas. The waste gunner spotted a medium-sized Jap cargo vessel. Beginning with a broadside attack, the Liberator made two runs over the target, dropping a total of nine 250-pound demolition bombs.
On January 26, the 13th struck near Balikpapan, continuing its campaign to harass Jap exploitation of Borneo's vital raw materials. A lone B-24 flew low over Dong Dang River to drop delayed action bombs at the pipeline bridge between the Louise and Balikpapan oil fields. The bridge had been severely damaged in a previous raid. To the Japs, these Borneo strikes foreshadowed the day when all their stolen stockpiles would be denied them. As the invasion of Luzon entered its ninth day, Morotai-based medium bombers flew against Cotabato town on Mindanao, second largest of the Philippine Islands. Skimming in at treetop level, 12 B-25s scattered over 823-pound parafrags through enemy dispersal areas. Each plane also swept the vicinity with fire from 13 50 caliber machine guns. The Jap installations were badly battered. This was one of a widespread series of attacks by the Far Eastern Air Force in the effort to neutralize bypassed enemy bases. On January 24th, Moratai-based mediums flew a similar mission against Siasi Island in the Sulu Group, south of Mindanao. In a minimum altitude attack, eight B-25s bombed and strafed Jap installations at Siasi Town, plastering the area with more than 523-pound parafrags. At the time of this attack, Allied air power had already minimized the threat of nearby Jap bases, and Allied ground troops had driven more than halfway across Luzon's Lingayen Plain on the road to Manila. On January 27, a Catalina of the 2nd Emergency Rescue Squadron flew into the volcanic enemy-held Sulu region to rescue the sole survivor of a B-25 that had crashed during the Siasi Island raid three days before. Guns were carefully charged, ready for any Jap plane that might... A flight surgeon, specially carried for this mission, made advanced preparations to receive the wounded man who had been badly burned in the crash. Rendezvous had been prearranged at Taiwi Taiwi, Philippine guerrilla headquarters, 70 miles southwest of Siasi, whence the wounded man had been removed. And as the rescue plane prepared to land, two boats bearing guerrillas and the surviving crew member put out to meet it. Among this group was a Filipino lieutenant colonel who commands guerrilla forces in the entire Sulu area. A Bataan veteran, he had been in the Philippine Army at war's outset. So had the guerrilla medical officer who had given the injured crewman treatment. After a hurried check, the burned flyer was put aboard. Also returning for treatment was a blind Spanish-American war veteran and his half-caste young son. Medical supplies and personal necessities brought for the guerrillas and the natives were unloaded. Gifts were quickly distributed on the spot, while an escorting B-25 protectively buzzed overhead. Belated Christmas presents for native children had also been brought. Many of these natives are called sea gypsies, for they live on the water, traveling from island to island in their small boats. All are of invaluable aid in fighting the Japs, and officers conferred about equipment to be sent them. On the return trip, two bottles of blood plasma, priceless gift from the home front, were administered to the wounded sergeant. At Moratai, teammates were waiting for Dumbo to slide into home base and chalk up another run for the team's high rescue score. Daily performance like this is not only bringing men back to be renewed by the high skill of our medical corps, it's winning the added respect of Filipino guerrillas, who, inspired by this assistance, are themselves assisting the allies to their utmost working and fighting for the freedom we are already proving will be theirs. On February 1st, 24 liberators took off from Angaur. Their target, Corregidor. Tunneled into this tadpole-shaped fortress three years earlier, underfed and underweaponed men and women had held the Jap for four crucial months while an unready America prepared for total war. Now we were coming back with planes, with ships, with tanks, with thousand pound bombs, 
with all the gathered strength of allied mines and mills and workers and soldiers. Now Jap barracks and storehouses were being blasted and burned. Now it was the Jap who was fighting for time, hoping we might become disunited and soft. But Corregidor had been the very flame that had forged our unbreakable unity and our determination to achieve lasting victory. Now the Jap was spending lives to stave off inevitable disintegration and defeat. But time for the Jap was running out. The following day, the B-24s were back over the island. Thousand pounders battered into enemy supply dumps. The campaign to soften Corregidor for invasion was shifting into high. For the next two weeks, the attack mounted in intensity as the guns of the 7th Fleet joined in to help smash the island fortress. The end came swiftly and suddenly. At dawn on the 16th, the bombers struck. Paratroops landed. Rocket boats blasted a path across the beaches for infantry to come ashore. In 24 hours, Manila Bay was open to Allied ships. What had taken the Japs four months to do, we had accomplished in three weeks. This was combined operations. Gunside aiming point cameras record China sorties of 14th Air Force fighters. These are fairly good deflection shots, but an expert gunner would really clobber planes in a pass like this. Typical air combat shot, no time for a full burst. Good strafing on radar station. Targets should be knocked off one by one instead of strafing all, damaging none. These are good strafing passes. Accurate shooting and not much waste of ammunition. More to ward off than hit an attacker, this diversionary pass returns to the main business of good strafing. This kind keeps them grounded. 